Long Pross is a victim of sexual slavery, who was disfigured by her pimp. This is the girl over there. She's sitting there, and then this is the collection of our artificial eyes that we are going to put on her today. My yeah. female doctor, and I picked the color. You've got a circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. and then yeah. I picked this too. Looks similar as her eye color yeah. that uh, we're going to try to put on her eyes today. This is the standard artificial eye. You may need to have one of the uh, visiting eye guys from America or something. Get a mid to match eye, right? Right, because you've still got quite a bit of defect up here. But this will typically be, to me, two or three operations to get it right, to get the best, the best result. <laughs> You know, sort of a little bit scary, but she wants to do it. <laughs> uh, she doesn't think anything too much right now. She just focused on her surgery. She said that she likes to see, to look normal, let's say. Uh -huh. Don't cry like a baby. <laughs> Performing the operation will be Dr. Sung Soryu. It looks a lot better. Yeah, yeah it looks a lot better. When we, we uh, put the active cell in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. This girl was, uh, was kidnapped as a child and then sold into sexual slavery and uh, worked as a prostitute for about seven years. And then one day uh, her pimp stuck her in the eye with an iron uh, spike and infected all her eye. That was in 2006. And she was still made to work after that, but uh, about a month later, it was all pussed out and nobody wanted her, so she was then thrown out of the brothel, went to the other, another eye hospital, Takio Eye Hospital, where they took the eye out and treated her for the infection. They didn't have artificial eyes, so, and they don't do reconstructions too much, so they sent her here. So we operated on her in October and put a false eye in, but the socket was so deficient and there was so much space that the eye fell back too far. So in December, we put in a graft from her scalp that's gone into the back of the eye to fill up the orbit. And now we put the eye in again and uh, are trying to make it look a lot better. So it will look better after this, but we'll probably have to do it once or twice more um, to, to uh, get a really good result, right? We'll have to trim it a bit, let the tissue shrink a bit, see what happens, and uh, get it all done. So it'll be six to nine months before we've really finished and by that time she should look pretty good. The eye won't move, but it's, it'll be the same color as the other side, and it'll look normal when she looks straight ahead. Evening at home in the Gologly house. Oh, Kanya and Jim watch their daughter Uma's first steps. You're gonna walk to Daddy? Yeah. Can you walk to Daddy? <laughs> oh, no, 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 not too fast. No. Just go there, stand there, Liam, Okay, okay. okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Back at the surgical center is Gologly's son from a previous marriage. Sovrab is also an orthopedic surgeon. He takes a break from his private practice in Monterey, California, each year to help with his father's mission. Sovrab um, basically went to school in the States, having been born in England, and is, a, is an orthopedic surgeon and specializes in spines and hip replacements, redo hips, as they call it in the business, and works in Monterey, California, and comes over here once a year. all just necrotic and gone. You right. couldn't find two different practices than my practice back home and private practice in Monterey, California, my experience of coming to Cambodia. Um, back home, I see patients in clinic three days a week. I operate two days a week. I operate in the crown jewel of hospitals in, in California, which is an absolutely beautiful, you know, hundred, couple hundred million dollar facility um, with views over the ocean and from our operating rooms. Um, it's clean, it's white, it's sterile, there are very, very nice cars in the garage, um, and people have extraordinarily high expectations. Here it's completely different. We're operating with operations going on at the same time in an operating room. All of the equipment here is clutched together, it's begged, borrowed, and stolen from various different sources all around the world. And the patients that we see come here from all over Cambodia, largely by word of mouth, with some of the most horrendous diseases that you can imagine. I always tell people that the greatest thing about going to Cambodia is the first thing that you can get out of your medical vocabulary is the question, what brings you to the doctor's office today? 
because if it's not readily apparent by the time it walks in the clinic, it's rare that it's something that we're going to treat over here. And then the other thing is, is that as you've noticed by, by being here, you know, you can see some of the most horrendous aspects of disease here in Cambodia. I mean, sometimes clinic and at Children's Surgical Center is a little bit like the bar scene in the Star Wars movie. I mean, there are things that you just simply don't typically see. And so I always, I really enjoy coming every year. It's, it's a difficult trip. I always go home pretty worn out and exhausted. It's um, emotionally challenging, and, it's, and the surgery the, itself is very, very difficult here. But um, it's been rewarding to see the progression of skills in the, in the institution over time. In the consulting room, their collective expertise is needed in the case of nine-year-old Munchan Wiesner. Where's he been getting treated? Who's been giving him uh, the braces? Uh, in, uh... He was born with severe deformities of both feet and one hand. The team must weigh up their options. Okay, this hand is good. Does he go to school? Yeah, he's Yeah, Maybe I'll get something out of that, huh? Yeah, I think he can do that. But, you know, let's leave that for the hand guy. Right, we'll find the hand guy for that. Let's, let's do these things. We'll never get a foot guy. Right, we've got to do this ourselves. Show us your hand, Twinny. Right, okay. Okay. Given the challenge of operating on such rare deformities, the boy's case is the kind that attracts interest from overseas specialists. Okay. He's got two, right, metatarsals, and the toy is bifid. Details of his deformities are compiled in the hope that an overseas hospital will take on his case. Sohrab Gologli's specialization is spinal surgery, and several cases have been awaiting his visit. Among them is Teng Navi, a 13-year-old girl suffering from scoliosis, or curvature of the spine. Three spines. New spine. Three new spines. Where are they? Um, yeah. Three new spines? Yeah, right. Okay, come on in. Yeah, so this is um, this is a you know a 13 year old girl with scoliosis. Looks like she's got a little hemivertebra here. Um, measuring the curve with a technique called the Cobb method, and then she also has this really bad curve like this. 13 year old female. Assisting in the operation will be Dr. Ucheng Yep, the most senior of the center's Cambodian surgeons. When she goes to school, usually she was teased by, she's teased by her friend about her spine that's abnormal, it's curved. So that now she wants to have her spine straight like the other kid. That's why she wanted me to have the operation. So Nip is uh, more or less my right hand. I would say he's one of the best surgeons I've ever met in my life. Not just Cambodia, ever. Uh, a guy who can come up look at the new problem, is willing to take it on, learns how to deal with it, and can think straight within the parameters of that problem. But Dr. Niep wasn't always going to be a doctor. He'd wanted to be an engineer, but the Khmer Rouge changed all that. What made you want to be a doctor? Um, I say at him, uh, it was uh, my father's death during the Khmer Rouge. I had wanted to be an engineer, but uh, then I had switched to be a medical doctor. Just outside Phnom Penh, Cambodia's notorious killing fields, the site where thousands of victims of the Khmer Rouge lost their lives. Across Cambodia, it's estimated the genocide killed two million people. Anyone considered part of the educated elite was especially at risk, including the country's doctors. I think before the Khmer Rouge, we have uh, several hundred doctors. And then when the Khmer Rouge came to power, then uh, all the doctors, all the officers, all, everybody had to leave the town to, work, to go to work on the rice field and so on. And there, some uh, or most of them get killed or were starved to death, something like that, got a lot of torture. Then, uh, after the Khmer Rouge, I think only uh, very few doctors come back alive. The one I saw you yesterday with, and I said you can do the osteochondroma. Still trying to rebuild the medical system, Cambodia remains heavily dependent on foreign help.
but Dr. Ngyep knows that one day they must become self-reliant. I, I fully agree with the idea that the Cam Cambodian doctor must not rely too much on the foreign doctors because this is Cambodian, this is our country, so it should be our country by ourselves. So if you figure out that it's going to With be that foreign help comes something of a culture clash, especially in the form of Dr. Jim Golagly. Why don't you just say to me, okay, we thought about that, it ain't going to work, right? Hailing from an old school right. medical tradition, his abrasive style is sometimes at odds with the younger generation and often at odds with the softly spoken ways of the Cambodians. Yeah, we need to find out what's wrong with that kid. Right, right, right. What's the matter with him? You know? Broken leg. A broken leg. Yeah. Well, it doesn't yes. wait for Dr. Nia. Bring him in now. Let me have a look at the x-ray. Has he got an x-ray? I, you know, I look at my dad and I have an incredible amount of admiration for him. Broken leg? I think that there are few people that could accomplish this, and I think that uh, there are undeniable personality traits that some people would call dictatorial, um, some people would call bulldozer-like that allows someone to come to a country like this and build a hospital up to the point where it does 4,000 operations a year. So, Clay, cut it out. I did this whole operation without an IV. I don't want an IV oh, now. Just yeah. 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 Oh, hemogram. Why can't you stick it in the groin? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just awful. I mean, you know, you can basically take some blood right here. Uh -huh. No problem, uh -huh. right? Okay. I, you know, whether I'm an explosive Irishman or whatever. <laughs> Um, no, if, if I say things nice and quietly, they don't always react, they don't always quite understand, and they don't understand it's a request or an order or anything like that. Also, there's a generational thing, you know, as medicine has evolved, it used to be very common for people in the first world to have personalities like my dad. There used to be a lot more screaming and shouting, there used to be a lot more thrown instruments in the operating room. It used to be acceptable to kind of lose your temper. Um, and now, of course, that's not the case anymore. I mean, we live in an environment where we're really good at what we do. We, you know, we basically are following a flight plan. The expectation is, is that we're calm and you know, polite to everybody. And if not, we end up probably in some sexual harassment committee somewhere <laughs> explaining our behavior to somebody else. Me, when I started to know him, it became to me very strange when he shout and he scream. <laughs> but now I used to him. I know that he's a kind man. Fingers out. You take this finger off now. You don't need these fingers. You don't need these fingers now. I, I... <sighs> In Cambodia, because okay. of the language problem, okay. they're right. paying attention more to the tone than to what the words are. Very good, Sokling. Very good. Good. Got a name on and everything? So I've got to change the tone depending on what I want done. And if I want something done, and I just say it nice and calmly, can we transfer this patient over there and let me know when it's done. It's, it's just a conversation. They're not paying very much attention. But if I say, now transfer that patient over there and call me when it's finished, then it's far more likely to get done. <laughs> and then I'll be less frustrated. <laughs> Thorab so, so, uh, is um, quiet and very friendly. He will not shy, he's more patient. But Tim is here. <laughs> this is a bit of difference between the, the father and the son. <laughs> it's with the son that Dr. Nyep will be working as Teng Navi is prepared for her back operation. So the way this will work is Nyep will do it. I, I do one half and then Nyep does the other half. And in the process, get the operation done. So we'll give her a general anesthetic. She'll lie um, face down on the operating room table. It will be a large incision. And then we're using older generation spinal instrumentation here. We have kind of a hodgepodge of different forms of instrumentation that, um, that have been available to us that we've scavenged over the years from various different hospitals and donations. And so we'll hook that up with two um, stainless steel instrumentation rods and place something that we call sublaminar wires underneath a portion of the spine and try to correct the spine as much as possible given the limits of the instrumentation that we have and also the fact that this isn't really the most ideal setting in the world to do really, really aggressive correction. And you know, if this was done back home in the United States, we'd have a neurologist monitoring spinal cord function. And the, the thing that we worry the most about is someone who has a cosmetic deformity of the spine that we know that's going to get worse over many years, has a spinal operation and wakes up paraplegic. So this is an example of how rare this case would be in the United States. 
over a 25-year period, I think there may be 15 or 20 cases.